Gospel of Matthew now in the New Testament, and we're going to be looking at chapter 3 today. Last week we looked at Matthew chapter 1, the genealogical record of Jesus leading up to his birth. Then chapter 2 of Matthew gives us details about the birth of Jesus, which we read every Christmas. So I'm going to skip chapter 2 and go right to chapter 3 today. And when you go from Matthew chapter 2 to Matthew chapter 3, you are advancing about 28 years. Matthew leaves the end of chapter 2 with Jesus being around age 2, and he begins chapter 3 with Jesus launching his public ministry at the age of 30. So we're advancing about 28 years from chapter 2 to chapter 3. The Gospels are pretty much silent on the childhood of Jesus. With the exception of the Gospel of Luke, Luke Luke mentions one incident that happened when Jesus was 12 years of age and Jesus was at the temple court area and his family accidentally left him and that's a whole other story, but we'll see that when we get to the Gospel of Luke. That's the only other reference we have to any of Jesus' childhood when he was 12 years, that one incident found only in the Gospel of Luke. Otherwise, Matthew, Mark, and John are silent about his childhood and that's the same here with Matthew, as we go from chapter 2 to chapter 3, he skips the childhood of Jesus. He goes right from Jesus at age 2 to Jesus launching his public ministry around age 30. And at the beginning of chapter 3 here, you will notice that we are introduced to someone who is familiar to the Gospels. He is the one who will herald the arrival of the Messiah. He is none other than John the Baptist. So the first 12 verses here are devoted to John the Baptist. And uh, Matthew gives us some information about him. And so I'd like to read verses 1 through 12 here from Matthew chapter 3. And then we'll, we'll just kind of focus in on, on verse 11 in particular. But this is what it says here in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying... The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So you get the idea. This guy was just a great outdoorsman, you know, just eating uh, bark and uh, locusts and, you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, wearing outfits made of camel's hair and leather. So, you know, and just kind of picture kind of this woolly creature you know, bear's grill, just a little bit out in the wilderness and, and weathered and all that good stuff. So here he is, a real mountaineer kind of a guy. Verse 5, and then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, he calls them snakes here, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, and even now the the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pause there and pray. Lord, as we bow our heads and our hearts before you, we just humble ourselves in your house today. We're thankful for the opportunity to once again start to regather in the church, and we just pray now that you'll be glorified in our time and your word, that you'd use it to strengthen our hearts. I know, Lord, we're still separated in large part, some watching, most watching online, some gathered here, but together, Lord, we just thank you that we can join in reading your word, studying together here from Matthew 3. Use it to speak to our hearts today and strengthen us, Lord. Continue to bring healing to those who are sick. Continue to eradicate this virus, we pray, and help us to return back to full ministry here, Lord, as soon as possible. So we we thank you for this day you've given us. Bless again all the dads on this Father's Day, and thank you for being our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You will notice here that uh, it is not John the Methodist, it is not John the Lutheran, It is not John the Presbyterian, it is John the Baptist. 
And uh, even though I joke about him, he's not really a part of a denomination. But the reason he's called John the Baptist is because the main focus of his ministry involved what? Baptizing people. So that's the reason he's called John the Baptist. He went around baptizing people. And he said here in particular in verse 11, that's going to be our, our verse we're focusing on today. He said, I indeed baptize you with water. You can circle the word water in your Bibles or highlight it if you have an electronic Bible. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me, mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Who's he talking about? Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, circle that, Holy Spirit, and fire, circle fire. What we have here presented in verse 11 are three types of baptisms that John the Baptist tells us about. The baptism of water, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of fire. John says, I'm doing number one, but number two and number three come from Jesus. And the truth is that as believers, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you either will or should experience all three of these. You either will or should experience all three of these. So we need to understand what all three of these are as John the Baptist presents these things. Now let's start with first things first and just understand the basic. The word baptize in, uh, in English is from the Greek word baptizo. And baptizo means to immerse, submerge, or to overwhelm. That's what the very word baptize means. And the first of the three that he mentions here is probably the one that we are most familiar with, and that is the baptism of water. And there are actually two types of baptism of water that are mentioned here in the Gospels. And the first one is the one that John was actually practicing. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance in anticipation of the Messiah. And so the prophets foretold that one would come as a messenger, a herald, uh, announcing the Messiah, and, and that's John the Baptist. In fact, in fact, Matthew quotes from Isaiah the prophet, saying he is the one who was foretold by the ancient prophets. John the Baptist would come to announce to herald that, that the Messiah, that Jesus, has come onto the world scene. And so in anticipation of the public launch of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist went around preaching repentance and asking people to come to that place of surrender because Messiah was here. Now, Jesus would not be publicly recognized until, in fact, Jesus himself comes to be baptized by water. John the Baptist at first says, you know, I'm not worthy to do this. Jesus says, well, this is the fulfillment of the Father. This is kind of the, the coronation of, of the public ministry of Jesus. And so, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, but John the Baptist was the one who said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As Jesus was coming to be baptized, John the Baptist specifically is pointing people to Jesus. Listen, this is the Lamb who's come to die for the sins of the world. And so that was John's role. He was to prepare the way of the Messiah, announce the way of the Messiah. And so people were coming to John to be baptized in the Jordan River, and it was in anticipation of the Messiah. So they were coming basically saying, baptize me, immerse me in water as a symbolic gesture that I come to, to repent of my sins, to turn from my sins, and to turn towards the Messiah, anticipating his, his arrival onto the world scene. That was John's baptism. But we don't practice that baptism anymore because Messiah has already come. So we're not... We're not anticipating Messiah. We're not baptizing in anticipation of Messiah because Jesus has come. So what we do today, the water baptism that we practice is Jesus's baptism. And Jesus's baptism was a baptism of regeneration in proclamation of the Messiah. And so regeneration just means a new birth. And when we come to salvation, when we come to faith in Jesus, we are, what the Bible says, is born again. And then because we're born again, we are water baptized, not as a necessity for salvation, but to identify with Jesus that our sins have been forgiven, we've been washed, we've been cleansed, and, and we identify with the risen Lord and we live a new life. So we're renouncing the old life and we're living a new life for the glory of God. And so water baptism is also symbolic of a surrendered life. 
but not in anticipation of Messiah, in proclamation. We're, we're making a proclamation through water baptism that we have trusted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 28, part of what we call the Great Commission, when he said in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this is the type of baptism that we practice today. It is a baptism that identifies with the finished work of Christ. It's an individual saying that they have by faith accepted Jesus and now they want to be baptized as an external act that communicates an internal work. The internal work of a heart that's been changed through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're water baptized in obedience to the Great Commission to do as Jesus told us to do, not because it's required for salvation, but as a demonstration of our salvation, proclaiming Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now, if you have a church tradition like I do, and some of you do, and some of you don't, some of you were not raised in the church, and you, you've come to Cornerstone, and this is all kind of new to you, but in the tradition I grew up in, I was baptized Methodist style. And Methodist style baptism was when you're an infant, you're sprinkled with water uh, because John Wesley preached infant baptism. And he made some arguments from Scripture that, that um, you know, some, some would agree with. I don't agree with infant baptism. We dedicate infants. But, but so I was baptized. I had no choice in it. I'm like, you know, a few weeks old. And so I had no stay in the matter. And so my parents had me sprinkled. Actually, my grandfather was the pastor at the time. So he, he uh, baptized me, sprinkled me. Then I got saved as a teenager, and then I started reading the Bible and realizing that water baptism, scripturally speaking, is a declaration of your faith in Jesus. Well, I, I couldn't declare my faith in Jesus when I was a few weeks old, so I realized I've not really been baptized. So I was sprinkled as an infant, got saved as a teenager, and then actually when I was started to date Terry, I was like 21, then I realized I need to be water baptized. So my uncle, who was a pastor at the time, baptized me in a fishing pond on the other side of Frederick. So everybody has your story, and I would encourage you, if you have not been water baptized since coming to faith in Jesus, that you should consider that. Again, not as a requirement for salvation, but just an obedience to, to identify with the finished work of Christ. My life under the water is past, cleansed. I come up out of the water, a new person to declare my relationship with Jesus. So here at Cornerstone, we do practice baptism by immersion. We'll, we'll dunk you. And I'll, I'll hold you under depending on how much sin I think is in your life. No, I won't do that. I won't do that. I've only lost three. No, I, no, I haven't lost anybody. Um, and, and, and to be honest with you, some people have physical limitations where they can't be immersed. And so it's okay. We'll, we'll you know, take like a, a pitcher of water, a cup of water, and, and pour it over somebody. So it's not, again, we're not dogmatic about it because it's not a salvation issue. But it is in terms of how it should be practiced. The reason we practice immersion is, again, the very definition of the word baptize. Baptizo means overwhelm, submerge, immerse. So that's why we do that. Um, and, and so, you know, every time we go to Israel, by the way, it's always a great time. I've, I've probably baptized a few hundred people now in the Jordan River. So it's, it's just a wonderful identification with the finished work of Christ. That's what we practice today. Jesus' baptism, not John's baptism. But that's a baptism of water. The second thing that John talks about here in this verse is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I find it a little bit humorous that the first person who talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a Baptist. Now, if you don't get that joke, it's because you haven't been around church very long, but, but most of my Baptist friends, not all, most of my Baptist friends believe that the gifts of the Spirit ended at the end of the apostolic age and would not embrace what we call today the baptism of the Holy Spirit as, as an experience that a person could have today. There are some within Christianity, some circles, uh, that would say the baptism of the Holy Spirit was something that was relegated to biblical times, first century, and then when the last of the apostles died, that ended the apostolic age, and that, that ended those spiritual gifts. Um, I don't hold to that uh, interpretation of Scripture. I still believe the gifts are available today. I still believe the baptism of the Spirit is available today. And I wish I had more time to develop this. The, the fact is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit deserves an entire Sunday by itself and probably a series of messages which 
we will get to eventually when we get into the book of Acts. So what I'm going to share with you now in the next few minutes is a very cursory overview of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And probably the quickest and, and most succinct way that I can communicate the baptism of the Holy Spirit as just one aspect of three that we're looking at today is by pointing your attention to three different prepositions that are used, not just in the English language, but in the original Greek language of the New Testament to communicate the threefold ministry of the Holy Spirit. The first preposition that we see used in Scripture about the Holy Spirit is the word with. The word with. The Spirit is with us to lead us to Christ. I'm going to read out of John's Gospel, chapter 14. You can just listen or turn there. I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. This is John 14, verse 16. Jesus speaking here. He says, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that's capital H, that's the Spirit, that He may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and shall be in you. Well, the first preposition that Jesus uses there, and it is para in the Greek, P-A-R-A, -A, is that the Holy Spirit is presently, present tense, with you. Now, potter in the Greek means around or near. He's not yet in you. Jesus uses the next preposition in the rest of that verse in future tense. He said, he said, there are people who don't understand what I'm about to say to you, but you know him for he is with you, present tense, and shall be in you, future tense. I'll get to the second preposition in a moment. First, the idea of with. What does it mean when Jesus says the Holy Spirit is with you? The, the first thing that the Holy Spirit does in, in bringing us into a relationship with Christ, and by the way, that's exactly the ministry of the Holy Spirit. None of us has come to a relationship and a knowledge of Jesus except that the Holy Spirit has helped us. Amen. And the Holy Spirit helps us because he brings conviction to our hearts, convicts us about sin, and reveals to us the truth about who Jesus is, such that then we exercise our will to receive him and to invite him to be our Lord and Savior, to accept him as Savior. But that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit with us, wooing us, drawing us, leading us, convicting us. That's the ministry of with, para. That's the Holy Spirit, first at work, okay? Then Jesus says in the same verse, John 14, 17, that the Holy Spirit is with you and shall be in you. Now, the audience he is speaking to are his disciples. So there's a specific context, and then there's a broader application. So we can learn from this as to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. First, the Spirit is with us, wooing us, drawing us. But then the Holy Spirit comes in us when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. When we come into personal relationship with Jesus, and we by faith accept him as our Lord and Savior, we use this terminology that Jesus comes into our heart. Well, what we really mean is that the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, the God's Spirit, resides within our spirit. Mankind is made up of three par parts, body, soul, and spirit. Now, your soul and your spirit are inextricably linked because your soul is the seat of your emotion, your will, your conscience. And your, your spirit is, is, what is, the, is what houses your soul. So the two of those are connected. And then what houses your spirit and your soul is your body of flesh. Well, one day when we die, our spirit and soul link together and sometimes interchangeably used in scripture, soul and spirit, but link together vacate our body to go to be with the Lord, if you know Christ as your Savior, okay? Our, our fleshly body is just a shell. It's just a shell. There's a, an, epit an epitaph that I read years ago on a tombstone and that I often quote at funerals just to give people hope, but it was about this guy who died. His, na his last name was Pease, like green peas, P-E-A-S. The epitaph said, here lies the body of old man Pease, buried neath the flowers and trees. Peas ain't here, just the pod. Peas shelled out and went to God. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the truth, that when we die, we just leave the shell of our body. Okay. But our spirit is within our bodies presently. And when you come into relationship with Jesus by faith, the spirit of God then comes in you, comes in you. Now, when exactly did the Holy Spirit come in the disciples? The Holy Spirit came in the disciples when they 
were, if you will, born again. Well, when were they born again? They were always hanging around Jesus. They understood who he was. They declared, Matthew 16, Peter's the one who says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Yeah, but when did they put their faith and trust in him after he had died on the cross for their sins? Answer is, in John chapter 20, when Jesus appears to them in his resurrected form, after he had died, rose again from the dead, when he first appears to them, this is what he says in John chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 19 to 22. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side because he wanted them to see the marks of his crucifixion. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And it was at that moment that they, in effect, put their faith and trust in Jesus as the risen Lord who had died on the cross for their sins. And so when they believed and received, they also received the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathes on them there in John 20, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus is going to breathe on you and say, receive the Holy Spirit, you're receiving the Holy Spirit. Amen? I mean, there's, no, there's not going to be any debate about it. it. It's happening. But then it's curious to note that even after Jesus does this in John 20, a few weeks later, when he's about to ascend back into heaven, in Acts chapter 1, he tells the very same people to wait in Jerusalem for the gift my father promised, for in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought they got everything back in John 20. You see, that's where the third preposition comes into play because the third preposition Jesus uses is the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. It is the Greek word epi, E-P-I. And the reason why Jesus says, I'm gonna read it from Acts chapter one, that you're to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit, even though in John 20, he had breathed on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, is because there is a difference between the indwelling of the Spirit and the overflowing power of the Spirit. There's a difference. People can get saved and have the Spirit indwell them and go to heaven. It's, it's not, again, you're, you're gonna go to heaven. But if you want to live a life of power that the Holy Spirit intends for us to have, that's the baptizing work of the Spirit of God which comes upon an individual subsequent to a salvation experience. Here's what Jesus said in Acts chapter one. I'm gonna read verses five through eight. And he quotes, he refers back to the story we're reading here when John baptized with water. Listen to what Jesus said, Acts 1, 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at that time, at this time, restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. There's the third preposition. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, it's interesting, in the Gospels, the word love is emphasized over and over again. When you get to the book of Acts, the word love is not mentioned one time. The operative word in the book of Acts is power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Greek word for power is dunamis. We get our English word dynamite from that word. God wants us to live a powerful life filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might be effective witnesses, that we might have the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, that we might be baptized, overwhelmed by the work of the Holy Spirit, which is separate and distinct from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So. I know this has been a quick crash course, and we'll talk more about the baptism when we get to the book of Acts, but he is with us, drawing us. He comes in us when we get saved, and then he comes upon us in overflowing power when we're baptized by the Holy Spirit. You might ask, well, how do I get that baptizing work of the Holy Spirit? And Jesus answers it in Luke's gospel, chapter 11. This is what he tells us, verses 11 to 13. He says, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Like what dad would say, well, here's a stone. You want a, you want a piece of bread, but here's a stone instead. Nobody would do that. He says, or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? So Jesus said, you know, of course not. 
Of course not. Now, he's saying, but our earthly dads are sinful. We're all sinful. So in that context, the next verse, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? It's Luke eleven thirteen. 13. How do we get the baptizing work of the Spirit of God? You ask. You ask, you say, Lord, just baptize me, overflow your spirit within my heart, within my life, that I might have boldness and power and the fruit of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit and, and let God do that overwhelming work of his spirit in your heart and in your life. But ask him and God will do as he says he will do. The third baptizing experience that John refers to here is the baptism of fire. Now, typically, where fire is involved, it's not going to be a happy experience. And that is the case for the baptism of fire. Um, it is usually a, a, um, a painful experience when, when the Lord baptizes us with fire, but it is a refining work of God that brings about a better result in our lives. Because the baptism of fire is either because God is burning something out of our lives to grow us up, or he's burning something out of our lives to clean us up. The baptism of fire is either for maturity or for purity. It's one of those or both. That there are things in our lives that, that God sees that we need to grow up concerning. So sometimes the baptism of fire is to mature us. And then there's some things in our lives that, that the Lord sees that are sinful and he wants us to get rid of and deal with, and so he turns up the heat to purify us. It's one of those two things. The bottom line is he wants us to become more like him. And so the Lord will sometimes take us through the fire. He will sometimes turn up the heat in our lives to bring about a better result. And we can either resist it, which makes it more difficult for us, or, or we can just be asking him, Lord, you know, I, I feel like I'm going through the fire. You're taking me through some difficulties here. What is it you're trying to teach me? What is it you're trying to cleanse me of? And this is the way that the Lord works. Either way, the baptism of fire is intended to make us more like Christ. I, I, I threw a few verses up there on the screen for you. Here's one, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. This is what Peter said. He said, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Okay? We go through difficulties in our lives. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So Peter there says, now not all, but sometimes the trials we go through in our lives, God has allowed as a way to refine us, as a way to mature us or to purify us. And these trials have this, this way of, of just, you know, turning up the heat to expose some of these things in our lives so that, so that God can deal with them. Isaiah 48 verse 10 says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Some of you might, might right now feel like you're in the furnace of affliction. You're going through some things in your life that are very unpleasant, very difficult, very uncomfortable. And sometimes it's difficult to know. Uh, you know, sometimes we bring difficulty in our lives because of our own sinful choices. Sometimes there's difficulty in our lives because it has nothing to do with any of our choices. It's just like living in a fallen world and maybe the enemy is up to no good to try to discourage us. And then there are other times where the Lord is accomplishing his purposes through those trials. And he's allowing those things to expose some stuff that needs to be dealt with that otherwise would not have been noticed had everything been fine. And so sometimes the difficulties expose that stuff. Have you ever, have you ever noticed when, when you get into situations where you become stressed, that stuff comes out of you that you didn't think was there? Like, where'd that come from? Oh, it was there. It just didn't get exposed until the vessel got cracked, right? It's in the jar. Nobody knows until it gets cracked and then it spills out. And these are the kind of things that God wants to sometimes deal with us. Here's another verse out of Proverbs 17, verse 3. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. God is like a refiner's fire. And just as a goldsmith or a silversmith 
will turn up the heat in the furnace in order to melt the precious metal. In the process, what happens is under intense heat, the silver or the gold, as it's melted and heated, the impurities rise to the surface. It's called the dross. And then the silversmith or the goldsmith can skim those things off of the surface so that the metal becomes more pure, becomes more valuable. And in a similar way, you see, God will turn up the heat in our lives to expose the dross. So then God can deal with those things so that we might be more pure and more valuable and more mature. Again, it's not always pleasant. But in the long run, in the end, if we just press into Jesus, trust him through it, he brings about a better result. Maybe God is trying to refine your life. Maybe he's trying to refine your marriage. Sometimes he refines a church, sometimes a family, whatever it might be. Sometimes God will allow the heat to be turned up to deal with the things that need to be dealt with, that we might become more mature and more pure as valuable vessels for him. This is what God does. Now, the first two baptisms are, are our choice. The baptism of water is something we can choose to do or not. I, I hope that you will consider it if you haven't been baptized by water. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to pray and ask for that, but I trust that you would want that. The baptism by fire is God's doing, and he does it as he knows that we need it. And so regardless, all three of these, we either should or will experience. And so may God do his good work in our hearts, amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word today. And as we think about these different baptisms, we pray, Lord, if there's folks here that need to be water baptized, just as a testimony of their faith, that they would consider that as a step of obedience, as an act that honors you. And Lord, I pray also for those who have never really asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you tell us, Lord, right there in Luke eleven thirteen. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And so, Lord, we ask. We ask for you to overwhelm us and overflow us with your Holy Spirit. Baptize us, Lord, with the power of your Holy Spirit. Embolden us as your witnesses. We need your power in a day when we feel our strength is constantly being being drained from us. Empower us, Lord, as your witnesses. Pour out your fruit and your giftings in our lives for your glory. And Lord, in regards to the baptism of fire, if we're going through things right now, we pray you would just strengthen our hearts and help us to just lean into you. You're always so faithful, not to burn us like, like to scorch us, but you turn up the heat just enough to bring things to the surface that you want us to deal with so that we might become more mature or more pure, to be more like Jesus, Lord. So even though it's difficult, I pray for those going through the fire right now, that you would, at the same time that you're purging of things, Lord, that you would also encourage them. And that even this Bible study today might just be a gentle reminder to them that even though they're going through difficulties and affliction, that you're right there with us. You're right there with us, Lord, accomplishing your good purposes in our lives, in our homes, in our church. We trust you. We thank you for this time in your word. We pray that you be with us as we leave here today. Continue, Lord, to bring healing. Eradicate this virus, Lord. We, we're trusting you. We're looking to you in these days. Tension in our country. We just pray for your peace that passes all understanding. And we love you and praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.